when you see a police car pull up behind you. If you're like me, probably your heart flutters a little bit, doesn't it? And even if we're going just a few clicks over the speed limit, we tend to tap on the brakes to just slow down a little bit to the actual speed limit, right? Because the last thing we want is one of those yellow pieces of paper that looks like a ticket, right? Yet I'm sure there's more than a few of us here this morning who've had a ticket or two that we're certainly not proud of. I know I have. I know even as I entered the building here this morning, I was greeted by the words, did you get a ticket today? And it was because Peter remembered about a dozen years ago I came to preach here, and I didn't come to a complete stop at the intersection just south of here, and the policeman, or actually it was, it was the sheriff, followed me right into the church parking lot here. Some of you might remember that. I had to confess that I had hadn't uh, obeyed the law completely on that Sunday morning. It was a little embarrassing, I must say. Now, sometimes we're tempted to view God that same way, as a type of spiritual cop rather than a Savior God that He wants to be for us. View, we view God with a nightstick, with a flashlight, moving into the darker areas of our lives. God is waiting for us to just mess up and to, to hand us a sin citation. The problem is, when we view God that way, we tend to distance ourselves from God. And, and, and when we approach God that way, when we do something good, we, we, we try to grab God's attention. Hey, God, did you see what I did here? Did you see the good thing that I've just done? Aren't you proud of me, God? The Bible presents a different view of God. A God who wants us to pursue Him in response to Him pursuing us. A God who wants, to have, uh, wants us to have a rich and, and loving relationship with Him. And we see that very thing happening with Jesus throughout the, Old Testament, or throughout the New Testament, where crowds of people continually flock to Jesus to take in what He would say or do. Now in our text, we read about a woman who was actually forced into Jesus' presence. Because that's the last place that she wanted to be at that very moment. As verse, verse 3 says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman who was caught in the act of adultery. And they made her stand before the whole crowd that was there with Jesus. Can you just imagine how embarrassing that must have been for this woman to be publicly exposed like this? Which begs the question, where's the guy in this story? Why isn't he there along with the woman? Wasn't he involved in that same act of adultery? Now, to the religious leaders, that wasn't the issue. They were using this woman as a pawn for a, a bigger agenda. As they say to Jesus in verse 5, in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say, Jesus? And the text continues in verse 6. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing Jesus. Now, the religious leaders, they felt quite smug about this trap that they felt that they had set before Jesus. They were probably high-fiving each other just because they were so proud of what they were doing. And they figured that Jesus would lose whether he would say yes or no. If Jesus were to say no, he would be going against the law of Moses. 
And if he said yes, he'd violate the Roman law that said that no Jew could execute anyone without permission from the Roman authorities. Either way, we've got him, they felt to themselves, as they eagerly anticipated Jesus' answer to their question. It's somewhat like a fight breaking out in a school playground. Everyone rushes out to see what's happening. And in that same way, all eyes were on Jesus to see how he would respond. And Jesus responds in the strangest way. Verse 6 says, Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say what he wrote. There are some people who think that he, he might have been writing the sins of the people around him and pointing an arrow to where they were standing. Maybe he just wrote, Jesus was here. And when they accused Jesus of stalling and pushed him for an answer, they got the shock of their lives. All right, stone her, says Jesus in verse 7. But let those who have never sinned throw the first stone. Whoa. They weren't expecting that answer. It's like Jesus is saying, before you pick up that stone, take a good look in the mirror. Make sure that you're morally qualified to put this, this woman to death. And that certainly stopped them in their tracks. Still today, even the most dedicated Christian knows that they're not without sin. If I were to say here this morning, if you're without sin, you can stay here in the sanctuary and the rest of you can leave. I'd be the only one left standing here and I'd be leaving right with you. Because none of us are without fault. None of us have a right to judge anyone else because of our own sin. And then the most amazing thing happens. Verse 9 says, When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, maybe those who were the most aware of their shortcomings, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. And as they walked, were walking away, they probably muttered to each other, whose idea was this anyway? He got the better of us once again. And then we see Jesus interact with the woman for the first time in verse 10 and 11. Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No, sir, the woman said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Now, what I find most amazing about this story is that Jesus could have been the one to throw the first stone. Because Jesus was the only one there who was without sin. Yet, Jesus chooses not to stoop to that role as a judge to this woman. Instead, he steps into the role as Savior. As Jesus himself says in John 3, verse 17, for God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Instead of pouncing on this woman's sin, Jesus reaches out to her as the friend of sinners. Instead of her dying for her own sin by being hit by all kinds of rocks, Jesus was ready to die for her so that he could say to her, not guilty. 
And that then is the context for, for Jesus saying in verse 11, go now and sin no more. It's amazing if we really think about it, how Jesus accepts this woman unconditionally while yet not approving of her sin. He doesn't lecture her about her sin of adultery. He simply says, go now and sin no more. You're forgiven. Now go out and act like it. Live a life as if you know you are forgiven and sin no more. And guess what? That's what Jesus says to each one of us here this morning. We probably will never find ourselves in a situation where we'll be totally exposed like like this woman here in in the text. But go to that ugly place in your life for a moment. Go to that place where you would feel most ashamed about to be able to share some sinful situation, to be able to share that with others. That place where if it was broadcast on the screen here this morning, you would quickly run out of the door feeling full of guilt and shame. It wouldn't be a pretty scene, would it? I certainly wouldn't want that for myself. And you know what? Each one of us has a choice what to do with that ugly skeleton in our closet. We can ignore it. We can try to pretend that it doesn't exist. But that only leads to to more of a distancing of ourselves from God. Or you you can beat yourself up about those awful things in your life and find yourself getting sucked into a a spiritual sinkhole and, and feeling depressed about that. Or you can face up to the wrong in your life and you can put it at the feet of Jesus. Because Jesus wants to replace that guilt that we experience, that guilt and shame that we experience in our life, Jesus wants to replace that with His grace, like He did with the woman in this story. Jesus offers each one of us here this morning His unconditional love and forgiveness, even though we've done nothing to deserve it. We deserve it no more than this woman who was caught in adultery. That's what we've celebrated in the Lord's Supper this morning. God's undeserved favor to us in Jesus. Now I think sometimes we have a hard time wrapping our heads around what Jesus has done for us. You see, we we, we live in a world where we don't expect a free ride for for anything. We we quickly dismiss those scams where someone from Europe or Africa is offering us a few million dollars if if we respond immediately. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. A number of years ago in a previous church where I served, I made one of those offers that seemed too good to be true. I pulled out a a $100 bill, and I said, whoever comes up here can have this $100 bill. Everyone sat there in stunned silence until one single adult walked up and grabbed the $100 bill only to drop it in the collection bag. The next day, the treasurer phoned me, wondering what they should do with that $100 bill that was in the collection bag. I guess it was the only $100 bill in there that Sunday. He figured I should at least get credit for it. 
But you know, that only shows that's the kind of society we live in. If, if you do something good, then you should get credit for it. And if you screw up, then you should pay. But you know what? It doesn't work that way with God's economy. The debt of our sin has already been paid by Jesus. And when Jesus hung on the cross, it's like He said, Henry, you deserve to be here because of your sin. But I have chosen to die in your place because of my love for you. And I want you to have a relationship with me. So I'm going to pay for it. So I can look at you and say, not guilty. Jesus says to us what he says to this woman in verse 11. Then neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. And Jesus wants us to embrace the forgiveness that he so freely offers to us. And then he wants us to respond accordingly, to leave that life of sin. And one way in which we do that is, is, is that we drop the rocks and that we quit trying to throw rocks at, at those who we, we are so quick to condemn. And that we're often so slow to show compassion to. You know, those people that we assume that they sin worse than we do. It's like the plaque that we've had on our fridge a number of years ago that I brought along a number of weeks ago. I have problems with people who sin differently than I do. I'll admit I'm still working on that myself. But I've learned that when I drop the rocks, then my hands are open to embrace people and to point them to Jesus. In my own life, I've had to learn to be less tolerant of the sin in my own life and to be more tolerant about the sin in other people's lives. Because Jesus wants us to drop the rocks because it's not our job to go around condemning other people. If Jesus wasn't ready to do that with this woman, who are we to think that we can go around condemning other people for their sin? As Jesus says in Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2 and 5, don't pick on people, says Jesus. Don't jump on their failures and criticize their faults unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging to yourself. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly smear on your own face. Wipe that ugly smear off your face, says Jesus, and you might be fit to offer a face cloth to your neighbor. And we also need to focus less on what Doug Fields suggests, to quit the quits, to suggest to our unchurched friends or neighbors, if you would only quit going to the bar, if you, you would only quit using the F word, if you would only quit watching or looking at certain, certain websites. You see, our Christian faith isn't so much about quitting as much as developing a deeper relationship with Jesus. I've learned in my own life when we model the joy of a deepening relationship with Jesus that results in a new level of, of attractiveness to people around us who don't have that kind of relationship with Jesus. And I've also discovered that when people begin to read the Bible for themselves 
and they come to faith in Jesus in a meaningful way, that they invariably come to the point where the Holy Spirit begins to convict them to quit doing some of the things in their lives that are not conducive to them growing in their relationship with Jesus. It's much more effective when people discover for themselves that they need to change certain things in their lives than for us to keep harping on them about certain things that we might not do for ourselves. You see, Jesus didn't send us into this world to condemn the world. He calls us to drop the rocks and to treat others the way He treats us, with His unconditional love and acceptance. Because that's the only way that we'll attract more sinners into the hospital of Christ's church. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for not treating us as our sins deserve. You know much better than we do those areas of our lives where we feel a sense of guilt a sense of shame. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for going to the cross to remove our sin, to remove all of our sin, to remove even those sins in our lives that we feel most ashamed about, that you now treat us as if we've never even sinned because you've, you've wiped the slate clean for us. Thank you for giving us a fresh new start for enabling us through the power of your Holy Spirit to live as if we are indeed forgiven. Help us to drop the rocks of judgment against others. Fill us with the kind of love and compassion for others that you have shown for us. And help us, Lord, to be the kind of church that's a true hospital for sinners so that people may come to know Jesus as the Savior of their lives also. And so we pray that in His name. Amen.